Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. We are so thrilled that you're able to join us tonight. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and I'm the Senior Manager of Public Programs here at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. I am so proud and excited to introduce this powerful collaboration between Sea Black Women and the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Sea Black Women is a collective of incredible artists and was formed as a response to the lack of opportunity and support for Black women in the art world. This collaboration is a call for accountability to engage with critical, long overdue conversations about power and representation in our cultural institutions. As educators, we are determined to expand the narrative and provide multiple access points to art. These programs create an opportunity to do so by centering the work, contributions, and expressions of Black women. We pose the questions, whose culture is this? Whose narrative is this? Who relates to this piece? Who feels seen here? Who feels inspired? The questions are endless, but we hope that this collaboration opens the possibility in the collective consciousness of radical imagination. Please join me in welcoming Sea Black Women. Earth is ghetto, I wanna leave, can you be me up? I'm out on the street by the corner store, you know the one on 15 Got a bright shirt on so I'm easy to see I've been down here stranded indefinitely I can't reach my planet but I need to leave You should see these people, it's hard to believe How they treat each other, it's hard to conceive Oh, Earth is ghetto, I wanna leave it As a seeker, a secret keeper, a griever, a writer, a poet, an artist, an activist, a teacher, a student, a death keeper, a ritual maker, a mother, a daughter, a cousin, a friend, a Medusa one who loves women, a dreaming of the Irish, the English, the German, the African and black women from which I both descend and arise. I have seen my own death in their eyes. Ultimately, I make myself recognizable to my ancestors in the way that a tear might be recognized by the sea, or the way the moon might long for the earth. This evening we begin on the moon, generating no light of its own. Sometimes the moon is referred to as a dead landscape. Don't be fooled. Like a long lost cousin, sibling, sis, the moon is a mirror, a reflection a reckoning in the era of violent deaths of black people occurring as public spectacle in the street, consumed on social media platforms, in your browser tab, in courtrooms claiming truth. It is often said when facing death for those who can see their death before death arrives, questions of love are present in the hearts and minds of the dying. Did they love well? Were they loved well? Each death is a reflection upon our own. To speak of death of the dead and blackness is specifically and intentionally to call upon the history of enslaved African peoples, of the Middle Passage, of those who survived and arrived on Turtle Island in the occupation that was the early breeding ground of colonial America, those who were discarded at sea along the way, and those who chose the sea along the way. Allowing your eyes to close, turning away from the camera eye, turning on your inner eye, tuning into your living, breathing body. Find and follow your breath. Breathing in. 
breathing out. Breathing in. And breathing out. Each breath is an opportunity to arrive again and again. Like the waves returning to shore, rivers returning to the ocean. Acknowledging everything you already did today to be here, reading the news, emailing, protesting, posting, tweeting, the washing, eating, all the work you already did. Find and follow your breath. Breathing in. And breathing out. Without judgment or analysis or critique, extending gratitude and love to your body, this body, for the breathing that it does without instruction. Set aside whatever happened today, whatever didn't happen, whatever is to come after our time together, let it float on by. Allow yourself to be right where you are. We gather as living, breathing people with broken hearts, mended hearts, patched together hearts, perhaps separated from those we love. Each breath is an opportunity to love again. Before this breath, this birth, who were you? Before this body, this life, this death, that death, who were you? In your mind's eye, in your body's eye, find yourself at the edge of the sea. See yourself at the edge of the sea. Psychically, spiritually, emotionally, physically, turn your body toward the water. See yourself turning toward the water, reorienting your whole body. Look out across the bay, along the shoreline, wherever you are. See who else has gathered at the water's edge. See who was already there before you arrived. The people who were there before you. The people who were there before those people. And the people who were there before those people. And before those people. See all your brothers and sisters turning toward the water, too. See your ancestors, your family, your lineage, biological, given, chosen, your friends, those who showed up for you when no one else did, your animal family, your extended family, old loves, lost loves. Who is there with you? In the distance, someone is coming toward you, someone you miss, someone you love. Make eye contact. See this person in front of you. Let them see you. Take hands because you can. Hold each other's hands or hug, extend a gesture of love. What needs to be said? What words are present in your heart? Notice any grief that is surfacing. Grief and love often orbit each other in and out of the wake of the other. Continuing to breathe. When you are ready to say goodbye, say goodbye. Who taught you how to grieve? Did someone teach you how to grieve? Who are you grieving?
as this moment begins to pass like all others, know that the waters are always there for you. Waves returning to shore, rivers returning to ocean. Waves returning to shore, rivers returning to the ocean. Each breath is an opportunity to arrive again and again. Okay, so let's begin with some breaths. Go ahead and close your eyes or cast your gaze downward, however that feels comfortable for you. Taking a deep breath in. And out. Each breath is an opportunity to arrive again and again. And when it feels comfortable coming back into our Zoom space, My name is Angela Hennessy. I am co-founder of See Black Women. I am an artist and a writer and a teacher and a student of death. I teach classes on visual and cultural narratives of death. Um, I make installations and big art sculptures, uh, primarily out of hair, but other materials as well. And hair being a material that um, is exchanged between the living and the dead is a particularly um, rich and uh, potential uh, material to speak to the ways that we navigate these relationships. I'm so thrilled to be joined with Tracy Brown and Olka Forrester today. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, read some introductions, read their bios. Um, Olka Balde is a storyteller, poet, yoga teacher, and nomad in the lineage of Fulani Griot. She has been an environmental justice activist, anti-police brutality activist for nearly a decade, and currently serves as communications manager for SE Justice Group, a California-based nonprofit that serves women with incarcerated loved ones. Olka is the founder of Black Moon Podcast, where she explores and interrogates the topic of Black death and holds space for collective healing that remediates the harm being done to our psyches from watching Black people die. Tracy Brown is a seasoned photographer, interdisciplinary artist, curator, artivist, and cultural event organizer who was born in San Francisco. She received her MFA in arts politics from New York University. She has spent more than 15 years photographing funerals and memorials all over the world and has taught photography, visual culture and capacity building in remote villages and grants management and tech management in urban centers. Tracy is also a participant in the takeover of the New, Mu New Museum in New York and her independently curated show, Same Game, Different Smokers, explored the effect tobacco industry targeting has on the black community. 
She is also curator of both Been Into the Bay series and the Ancestral Souls Rising Global Memorial for those who died from or during the COVID pandemic. Uh, so we will be discussing um, narratives of survival in sacred, public, and domestic realms. And I've loosely identified those spaces to think about um, death, how death and grief inform our spiritual work, our shared social space um, in public realms, what it means to live in a world where the death or the murder of Black people saturate uh, social media and news platforms every day. Um, and how that shows up in our experience of like literally just trying to get out of bed. Um, so all of our fat, all of our practices are multifaceted and multi-dimensional, um, and we'll be bringing this to the conversation about how Black women navigate the work of grieving amidst ongoing legacy of white supremacy and anti-Blackness. So welcome, thank you. Um, I want to start just with this kind of reflection around how each of you work with the dead and work with ancestor energy in very distinct ways. So maybe we could begin with a little bit of background of like how you arrived at this work. I can start. Um, so I think it's funny how I arrived at this work uh, because really my fascination with death began with um, uh, watching true crime with my mother, <laughs> watching Dateline, watching different true crime episodes and series, which was her very West African way of telling me to be careful all the time, <laughs> to take care when coming into the house, to look over my bag before I put the key in the door, to you know have cognizance around my own body and my own safety. And of course, true crime is like, all about talking about death, all about oftentimes talking about dead people and their stories and the people who took their lives as well. So I think that was really my first foray into kind of knowing that people are dying all the time in many different ways. In fact, a lot of times traumatic ways um, and uh, that being a connection point with my mother. That was my origin. Yeah. Yeah. I think my first experience was with death, um, really conscious experience was my grandfather dying at Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco. And um, and I was about six, I want to say. And I remember holding his hand and singing. Um, he's got the whole world in his hands <laughs> to him to comfort him in some of the last moments of his life. So I grew up um, going to funerals all the time because my family was big, but I also grew up without this crazy um, fear of death necessarily. I have fear death um, in a respectful manner, but I've always looked at death as being a natural part of life, which it is. Because the minute you start dying, the minute you start living, the minute you're born and the minute you start living, you, you start dying. You know, it's that even exchange. So, um, so that's how I got started in the work and just continued seeing things related to death and recognizing it as a great opportunity to um, illustrate cultural continuity and the, the way that people of the African diaspora all over the world are um, sharing attitudes and behaviors around memorialization and, and death practice. Yeah, so were you seeing then in, in your travels um, and photographing funerals abroad, um, then seeing the cultural inheritance like in your own family growing up in the South, growing up in the States, like seeing oh, yes. that sort of reflection? Oh yes, absolutely. And it was interesting because it, it would be like, I'm, I was in my own family mm -hmm. environment, but in a different language. So, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the pre-gatherings, um, the actual funeral itself, the social roles taken by people, um, the way that people mourn because people of African descent mourn very openly and very, and together, um, as long as they're in an environment that um, is um, a supportive environment that respects them mourning in their own culturally appropriate manner, um, we're gonna mourn openly and you know, so we're going to fall out and we're going to wail and we're going to this and, then, and also the pageantry, seeing the processions, even some of the implements, you know, whether it's everybody in 
um, in Benin there, they might have been wearing the same or similar fabric with some variance depending on who you were to the deceased person. And then you see that also in Suriname and you also see like these flags made of applique that they also do in Benin. You see these, you know, umbrellas and um, em embellished things and everybody wearing the same thing, whether you're in Haiti or you're in New Orleans or in Benin. So you see these like um, technical, these tangible implements um, all over the place. And that was really beautiful. It helped me definitely feel very at home but it also helped me to know what to work to capture, um, to tell the story. Well, and yeah, and I, I'm particularly interested in how textiles do that work, mediate those relationships, right? And communicate status, communicate grief, mm -hmm. um, you know, communicate one's identity and relationship to the deceased. Um, I wanna come back to something that you were talking about, Olka, in terms of, um, how your mother, you know, watching these true crime shows um, with her and sort of that, you know, understanding that as a teaching of being aware of your own body and being aware of your environment and your surroundings, right, which is a kind of thing I think mm -hmm. that, that Black families and specifically Black parents have to do with their children is that we are, you know, we are living with the threat of death on a day-to-day -day basis like it's not even about just walking out the door anymore because as we have seen so many um, stories in the news of, of black people being murdered in their own homes right so bringing that kind of awareness of you know that if there's anything that we can do right that it might be um, you know upon us to um, to, to be sort of hyper vigilant and, and hyper aware kind of all the time, right? So there's certainly the kind of exhaustion, right, that comes with, with living like that. And so I'm curious for you, Olka, with your program with Blackman uh, Podcast, how I can see now that evolution from what you were experiencing as a child and how that shows up in the work that you're doing, which is really about um, bringing, uh, you know, stories, um, bringing stories that often haven't been told, right? These stories that have been left out of larger shared narratives and um, stories that, you know, are deeply interwoven with, <clears throat> with um, injustice, right? And so how do we bring those stories into the light? So maybe you could talk a little bit about what that process has been like for you and the kind of, you know, there's like a great responsibility in what you're doing and telling those stories. Yeah. Yeah, you know, true crime and not only true crime, I think for me was also my mother normalizing death. Uh, one of her catchphrases is at some point, I'm not gonna be here. And she repeats that, she repeats that, I'm not gonna be here. And you're like, okay, whoa, it's 8 a.m. Um, you know, and, <laughs> and what I found, especially with the experience of true crime as and as my politic developed was that I was realizing that True crime is really about documenting traumatic events and then traumatic responses, especially as I became an abolitionist, right? Um, I would listen to these episodes and they would talk about, especially focus on the person who committed the violence and who ended the person's life. Um, and they would say, right, this person was a habitual offender, they had gone to jail, they had gone to prison, and then they had come out to do something way worse, right? Um, and the solution is if only they had been kept, if they had only had been kept from society forever, right? This wouldn't have happened. And what I don't hear the acknowledgement is this person was a person, they came into the world nonviolent, and then they became violent, that something happened to them, that their first experience with violence was not in the commission of it. And in fact, maybe prison and jail that they experienced made them worse and worse and worse until they got to this point. Um, and so as my politic developed and as I continued to listen to true crime, I started being able to evaluate how the trauma of having lost a loved one then lends itself well to a system that then re-traumatizes people by building these prisons and putting people in cages and putting them away forever. And then additionally within that, especially in focus 
focusing about the on the person who committed the violence is there's no real focus on the victim. Um, true crime podcasts love to say we focus on the victim here. They'll like tell you their name and a few fun facts about them, but most of it is really about the perpetrator. Um, and so when thinking about my own storytelling, I thought, no, I want to center the person who has passed away. And I want to tell their story in a way that is respectful and honors their life, especially with Black people. Um, one of the things that I've found in my work is that we are not honored in life and we're not honored in death as well, that the way that um, you know we are treated in life mirrors. Um, the first person I did the an episode on Marshawn McCarroll, it was something that just came to me, you know, like the name of the podcast came to me, his story had been with me for a while and it just came to me to do this. And um, what I realized when I was doing his story was that he was described by the media in ways that he didn't want to be. And no one ever checked in with his family, nobody asked his friends, Nobody asked anybody who knew him. They just wrote something about him and went with it and described him in this way to the entire world. Um, and when I did my podcast, I decided to have the specific value that I won't put out anything about someone who belonged to other people without checking with someone who knew them to say, can you review the script? Can you listen to this? Does, did I honor your loved one well? Um, and in doing so, I have found, you know, no, this thing that you read in 12 different stories and sources that you put in here is actually completely incorrect and doesn't honor this person. And so taking that time, going slow, checking in with the people they belong to, because these people did not belong to me in life, even as I tell their stories in death, um, and moving from there has really been my practice. So yeah, so that that the way that you describe the the name of the podcast and everything coming to you, and I experienced that quite a bit in the studio in my work, where you know, like if I if I can create a space with enough silence, a space where I can really be reflecting on you know what information is coming through, then like all kinds of information is coming through and sometimes it can be really overwhelming but i do i do believe that you know doing this kind of work being in relationship with the dead in such a in a really intentional way of course is um something that you know is that we're kind of compelled towards you know i feel like i couldn't be doing any other work like there isn't any other work that i want to be doing you know so i feel like i'm i'm on a particular path that um I have been called to, you know, to be on and, and that kind of guides me. Um, and so when I think about then what it means to honor that honor the work or to honor someone who has died and to honor their stories and their family and their community, um, that, you know, that I think it so often comes up in the role of naming in the, the practice of naming, right? And so if we think of how names are um, you know, partly like, you know, they've become a, a sort of protest, a rallying cry, um, you know, obviously they show up as hashtags on, on social media and in the news. And so to think about then the opportunity to really flesh out these stories, right? That, that maybe it begins with naming, um, but that there's also, you know, so much more that we can tell and share and, and bring into light. So I'm curious um, how you both approach that, um, the, the idea of naming the dead, when the dead are spoken of, how, how we can do that in the most respectful ways and, you know, I'm, I, I sometimes think about like if there are times that speaking the name of someone who has died is um, inappropriate or um, can be disrespectful, right? I, you know, I want to um, really quickly, it, along with what you're saying, touch on something that Olka said that I, I really like. She said that, you know, we're not honored in life or in death by mainstream society, but that makes our culturally appropriate valuable um, memorialization practices all the more important because they're about honoring 
the person and honoring their spirit and also honoring the sacred nature of the process of dying and that process of transition and your change of social status from the living to now that of the ancestor. So honoring their the the true sacred nature of who they are. It also helps me to um, digest the reality of all the positive things that you say about anybody once they're dead. I mean, it's, I have been at funerals of some of the most <laughs> interesting characters, I'll say. Um, but during the funeral service, people are like, oh, he was a good man. He did this and he did that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't know if I would have told that story while he was around. But um, but I think there's something to be said for appreciating the the perfect nature of spirit, even though manifestations have their imperfections. Um, in terms of the naming, I think it's, you know, we think about the power of a name. Um, in some cultures, there are certain names, especially names of deities or spiritual beings that are too sacred to be spoken. And also, um, you know, having a name is very important. There are ceremonies around names and giving of names. Um, when a lot oftentimes when you transition from one maybe spiritual state you get a new name when you change and you know when you graduate whether that's you have initiated into a spiritual system or whether you've been you know or somebody has come out you know a lot of my friends when they come out they will change their name and they have a different sort of identity so the name is really powerful really valuable or even um you somebody might join a gang and all of a sudden they get a new name or you you cross into a sorority and you get a new name, you know? Um, so names are really very important and lifting up the name of the dead um, is a sacred practice that's existed for, for ages. Um, I think that it's, it is very important that we say the names of those who have um, been taken so that folks from a political perspective do not forget the names of those who have been brutalized and whose lives ended, um, as we like to say earlier than they were supposed to, right? Um, yeah. But I think it's also, um, we have to be mindful because sometimes the uh, invoking of names is divisive. So when it comes from people who, like politicians who could very well have done things, um, to ensure the safety of people, but they didn't. And then they have the audacity to stand up and invoke those, the names of those who suffered because of their weakness, because of the politician's weakness. Um, that's, that's foul. Um, and also you have like in the tobacco industry, there's this invocation of names like Eric Garner and uh, George Floyd, when they talk about um, pushing back against tobacco policy, saying that, oh, well, this, that, and the third happened to them and it was related to cigarettes. So we shouldn't protect the black community from menthol cigarette products because it's going to like, that's a very divisive use of the invocation of our community's names. And that to me is like sin. When that happens, when you invoke the name of our martyrs in an effort to manipulate us emotionally into making choices that are unhealthy for us, I'm like, you're going to hell. I don't even believe in hell, but <laughs> I'm like, I'll adjust my belief on your behalf. <laughs> you done. Yeah. I think that this is, um, I love the way that you've asked this question, Angela, because right as Tracy was saying, invoking the names is so incredibly powerful. And for me in my practice, it is necessary to do so with names that people have forgotten or who refuse to speak for certain reasons and who need to be spoken, right? Like just as in life, we need recognition and to be seen, I think that's the same in death. But there is the other side of the coin too, right? In my culture, um, if there's like a child yelling your mother's name too often, right? They'll say, you're gonna use up my name. Like you're gonna finish it. How, ma how many times are you gonna call me? Like stop calling me. And, um, and that's something to be said, right? When every single person is saying the name of someone who has died without the same intention, without the same honor of that person without them having belonged to them. What does that do? What does that mean? I mean, Tracy, with you, you saying, you know, the politicians who invoke the names who they would have spit on you if they were alive, that's a curse for them. I'm like, you bet you need to be careful of what you're doing with that because you're inviting stuff you don't want to. Um, I know here I live in this 
very white area in Oakland. I could afford the price though. Um, and I was walking down the street and of course they have all their Black Lives Matter signs, uh, but no black people. Um, and there was spray painted on the ground the names of a few people who had passed away. And I was walking and as I saw it, I like moved instinctually, you know, just like to not step on the names of these people. Cause right in my culture as well, you can't step over somebody when they're laying down or like walk on top of them. That doesn't, that's incredibly disrespectful. And I'm thinking about, you know, someone who maybe meant well came to this public street in this white area and put these black names on the ground to be walked upon all day. That is completely inappropriate. You know, people who have put people's names on shirts and they're selling the shirts, but nobody who loved them sees the money is another thing that for me makes me uncomfortable that I know it is trying to remember them to have reverence, but we wonder, right, like, is selling them on a shirt, is that the way, is that really the way? Um, and I think it's really important that, I think as a society, especially with so many names, that we begin to be a little bit more intentional when we use them to even sit and ask permission and see, you know, what kind of feeling do you get? Is it yes, go forward or no, stop immediately? And you will get that feeling. Um, and yeah, I think this is a really awesome topic to be more considerate around. Yeah, I mean, I have a thing about names where <clears throat> it's been, it's such an immediate entry point, you know, in conversations about death. If, if, you know, if I'm working with my students and talking to them about death, it's one of the first things that we do is we talk about our relationship to the dead, like who died. And so, um, you know, beginning at that place of how we identify those people. And, and I'm really curious too about then, you know, do we call them the dead? Do we call them ancestors? Like those practices that ancestralize the dead, right? Because I think they're actually kind of two distinct sort of, um, I don't know, not quite categories, identities or, or two different ways of addressing the dead or addressing ancestors, right? Through language and through words. Um, but just in, in my own practice, I always feel like the first few days or maybe even up to a week after someone has died, I generally refrain from speaking their name. Just I, I feel like their energy and their spirit is still very present and whatever they are trying to do or whatever they need to do in that moment, like. The, the calling, uh, calling them in or calling them back. Um, I, I just, I feel like very sort of tentative around that. I usually try to let, you know, a certain amount of time pass, um, but it, it comes back to your comment, Olka, about like really checking in, you know, do I have permission to speak this person's name? And, you know, especially for, you know, if, it, if it's someone, you know, in my immediate family, that's a whole different set of relationships, right? But someone who kind of, um, you know, through their death, if it's a death in a very, you know, visible and public manner, right, they sort of become part of the collective Black family in a particular way. Um, so that, you know, I feel like that that's also then a different sort of sense of responsibility to, um, to that person and to their family. So I, I appreciate that kind of care and, and tenderness. And that's important, um, an important consideration. You know, there are, there are some cultures that say you don't um, pour libation, you don't do anything um, ritual um, for a year after the person has made their transition. So, I mean, so I totally understand that too, where you're like, you know, I want to be intentional. I know whenever somebody passes, um, when I hear that they've passed, I always turn within and ask um, the most high, the Holy spirits and the ancestors to smooth their transition, um, into their next existence. Um, so I definitely, I know that I'm very immediate about that because I want to just ask for that sort of spiritual support for them. I don't know if it helps anything, but it just makes me feel like, you know, in, in this, the spirit will know that someone who is still in this realm, um, loves them and is wishing them well on their journey. Um, but yeah, you know, that's definitely an important consideration. Yeah, I was thinking about that with, with Dante Wright and his murder. I was imagining him 
being received by George Floyd, you know, by Walter Scott, by Mike Brown, and Till, you know, that he um, has made this transition into this, I don't know what the place is, the place where dead black men go, um, that I feel like is a, a very sort of specific kind of role that we are, you know, recognizing uh, as a larger collective of Black people who are grieving, right? And seeing that we have this extended family, this kind of extended community of, of, of ancestors that, you know, each time someone dies, I imagine that they're being, you know, welcomed by this big family. Right, but then also their, ex their extended, extended ancestors. So not just the folks who have also fallen in with violence and with trauma, but also like their granny and their, you know, somebody from eight generations ago that they never met. And even like the ancestors, the primordial waters that, um, that uh, you know, substance from which all things are made and thinking about that, you know, for, on a, on a atomic level, like that is also part of our ancestry. So I like to also think about that um, being a part of the ancestral realm and also recognizing that we're so much larger than this trauma that we are, mm -hmm. that we're experiencing and that we have an arsenal of beings who are on our side, who are watching over us and helping us navigate these experiences, including the very um, traumatic experience of loss of life, regardless of what side we're on, um, meaning whether we are still with the living or whether we've made our transition. Yeah. So that brings me to thinking more specifically about rituals and about grief practices and one of um, the people that I was incredibly fortunate to have worked with um, was Sabon Fu Somme from Burkina Faso, who she died in 2016. Um, and the community rituals that she led um, just like completely uh, altered, changed, probably one of the biggest influences on how I relate to grief, how I experience grief the way that I um, make space for grief in my life and, and seeing the relationship between um, grieving practices as also love, a love practice. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what grief work looks like for each of you. And I'll add to actually one more thing. One of the things that Sabon Fu used to say that I was actually thinking about this morning in preparation is that, she would say, she would always say, take it to the altar, like whatever it is, whatever's going on, whatever's troubling you, whatever questions you have, take it to the altar. And in, in Dagara uh, grief rituals, you have the grief altar, you have forgiveness altar, and you have an ancestor altar, and you kind of move between those spaces. Um, and then of course, you know, I think for so many of the, you know, the, the narratives around Black folks thinking about the legacy of slavery, right? So much of that story begins in the sea. So often I go to the water, like that, you know, the water, the ocean as, as um, you know, the sort of grand altar, right? That I can um, send whatever is going on out in, into the ocean. So I'm curious what that looks like for each of you. Yeah, I'll say for myself that I don't think I really knew how to grieve until last year. Um, last year, it felt like something cracked open or there was way too much and it, you just needed to really release. And so um, I attended my first uh, kind of intentional grief ritual and ceremony with um, a practitioner who was here in Oakland named Akua Disa. And they also actually, um, speaking of Zabon Fu, so may also had worked with her and uh, tell a story about um, a story that she told about um, someone going to Burkina Faso and describing kind of what Western society looked like and her saying, oh, that's not and an elder saying that sounds like people who haven't grieved. That sounds like people who have com compacted grief in them. Um, and so you know, in that ceremony and since from Akua, I've really learned about holding grief as a practice, as a regular kind of maintenance to my well-being um, of incorporating 
water, herbs, scents, sounds, uh, whatever feels supportive, crystals, you know, what, whatever it is that allows me to get that release and do so in a consistent practiced way. Um, certainly sitting at my altar as well, um, sitting there writing to my grandmother, kind of asking questions. And for me, the more that I have leaned into asking questions about my dead loved ones, the more they've come to me, all of a sudden, like more names are coming and people are like, oh, did you know this about our family? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> okay. You know, I just sat at this altar at one time <laughs> and now here is everyone. Um, just having been waiting for me to desire and and go towards the road of um, grieving them and knowing them and knowing to practice grief um, in knowing them in this state now. Um, so that for me is really where I am currently with my grief practice. Um, I actually just attended a funeral this morning virtually. Um, my father in Cambodia passed away and it was also interesting to witness my family's their grief ceremony. You know, my mom was telling me to stop crying. She's like, stop crying. He's gone home. I was like, why aren't you crying? Um, you know, they took me up his funeral pyre and allowed me just to see his face one last time. Um, and that felt um, relieving almost to see his face because he looked so peaceful. And I was like, okay, you're good. We got to be good, you know? And um, yeah, so so that is my practice right now of just really recognition and repetitive practice. Another interesting thing I saw this morning was my older brother there had shaved his head bald, speaking of hair, Angela, which is a practice uh, in Cambodian culture when uh, the patriarch passes away, all of his sons are expected to shave themselves bald. Yeah. That's so interesting. They do that in Benin as well. And um, when I was oiling my scalp, this is a fun fact, I was oiling my scalp and um, I found a dead bug in my hair. Um, so my hair is super thick. So I found a dead bug in my hair and I was like, hair's coming off. Cause I was like, mm -mm, T Brown is not about to have bugs nesting in her hair. So, <laughs> so I went and shaved my head. You know, my hair was about shoulder length at the time, but I was like, it'll grow back, it's just hair. And um, I went and shaved my head and people were like bringing plates of food to my house and being like, I'm so sorry about your father. And I was like, what happened to my father? Like, he died, didn't he? We saw you shaved your head. I was like, oh, I found a bug in my hair. <laughs> but anyway, in terms of my own grief practice, I definitely, um, just like Olka, you know, my, my altar plays a central role in my life and in any transitional experience when a family member transitions. Um, I definitely make... Um, I definitely have a sort of personal ceremony around adding their image to my altar and just sort of, you know, welcoming them. Um, I have a cousin who's always been super supportive of me and I was finally able, um, you know, while he was living physically, um, I was finally able to get a photo of him. And so putting his image on my altar was just like, a really big thing um, even though I would talk to him and you know I would um, um, when I communicate with my ancestors you know I would definitely um, he was always there he was present but I had a time when I needed a whole bunch of support and then all of a sudden I started thinking about him and I realized what a wonderful support he was to me in during his life so um, so I'm definitely um, have a lot of ceremony around grief I also um, recognize how how painful grief is and being a make it better person and being a caretaker, recognizing that's a part of my makeup um, as a human. Um, I don't want other people to suffer. So I know that um, for a long time while I was photographing um, funerals and photographing memorials, that was part of my death work, you know, um, documenting these processes and documenting these traditions, not just for educational purposes, but also because the families would say that the images helped them in their grieving process. So a lot of times they were like, I didn't even see any of this during the funeral. So you gave me the funeral. You gave me this space to grieve later. And they've even come together and like looked at the images together um, as part of their, their own process. But um, I know that um, 
I would also stop at altars and pray or sing, um, especially engaging youth because kids are out here and, you know, uh, things have changed in the spiritual world and and in spiritual community. And as a kid, like everybody kind of went to church when I was little. And even though Christianity wasn't my faith, I'm thankful that I grew up in a faith community because it taught me a lot about community. Um, And it also sort of nurtured my relationship with um, the divine. And um, I see a lot of kids out here not getting anything. Um, I see a society where children aren't spoken to as much because folks hand them devices and their, their heads are down in that. They don't see their environment. They're not sort of talk to while we're driving in the car um, because there's all this um, sort of focus on individual existence. So stopping at these altars and praying and singing and talking to kids about like, okay, you know, let's pour libation. Would you like to pray? Tell me about your friend. And, you know, um, it's been really helpful. And sometimes they're kind of like, who's this strange lady showing up here? But um, a lot of times they're like, man, thank you for doing this. Nobody ever talks to us about this stuff. And we don't, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I lost my friend. He was my best friend. I called him every day. What do I do now? You know, we see kids that are just desperate. So part of my um, eldership, um, and even though I'm definitely not elder elder, I'm older than a teenager. And I'm responsible for helping them when I see them. And part of me growing in my wisdom and growing into the space of an elder as I, you know, as I age is me practicing um, community responsibility um, around, especially the youth that I see that are absolutely grieving. Um, Interestingly enough, because I also uh, teach Zoom classes, I've become like the Zoom funeral director. So people keep mm-hmm. contacting me to run their memorials and their funerals. So I, for a while, it was like I was doing two, maybe sometimes three Zoom funerals a week. I was like, where, how did this happen? But, you know, spirit calls you to do what you do. So, Well, yeah, and just thinking about the ways that funeral practices and memorials have changed in the face of the pandemic, right? Um, I, well, you know, and I know for, I'm sure for myself that I became an artist because I didn't have um, clear uh, cultural inheritance around funeral practices or grief practices in my family. And as I got older and, um, you know, kind of understanding that my art making was the only place that I could go to, right? Um, And so that in a way is, has been the, you know, it's the way that I communicate with my ancestors, with my people, whether it's through materials or color palette or a particular, for a long time I was unraveling things. I was unraveling velvet and like wanting to just surrender, right? And that that has sort of been this way that I have, you know, kind of witnessed myself in a sense through the creation or the, the uncreation, the unmaking of things and allowing those materials to kind of speak to the emotional, spiritual, um, kind of psychic realm of, of like just kind of letting, letting everything go, letting it disintegrate, that there's some kind of a re- return to original elements. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, grinding mirrors, right? Thinking about how spirits and energy are contained in, in mirrors and in surfaces and, and that kind of dissipation that um, occurs the the grinding process of course is like very um, it's very meditative it's like that kind of labor and that work um, that you know I think that that grief work like really is it it is labor it is a practice um, I want to just uh, take a minute to to recognize any ancestors that are here and present those ancestors that. Um, guide and inform your work. Well, I'd definitely like to invoke the name of President Platts Ibaye and uh, Albert Grace Ibaye. Um, also, um, Dee Dee Washington Ibaye. She just made her transition mm-hmm. on the 31st of December. Um, and like, mm-hmm. you know, right before, not too long before midnight, which was really mm-hmm. jarring. Um, 
but um, also um, Helen Harley Ibaye, she's uh, my great aunt. She was like a mom to me. So, um, and then also those ancestors whose names I didn't know, but who prayed the prayers for me to be here. I know they're definitely with us today. Yeah, and I feel called to say my grandmother's name, Uma Balde, my grandfather, Papa Balde, um, and my recently departed adoptive father, Bahain. Um, for me, my father, I feel like is always with me and one of the people whose death really set me on this path, uh, James Thomas Chambers, his sister, my auntie, Yvonne Didi Clark Smith, who um, I think when she was alive, she was maybe a little bit concerned <laughs> about me doing this kind of work. Um, it was uncomfortable for her. But she, you know, I, I feel, I feel her guidance. I feel her presence. Thank you so much for joining me today. So good to be in conversation with you, to hear more about your work and your practices and all the things that you're doing. Um, all my love and blessings to you and I just have such deep gratitude to all of the people that made it possible for you to be here in this world that we are sharing time and space and energy on the planet together. Thank you. Give thanks. Thank both of you. Thank you both.